good day, everybody. This is my pleasure as ESOU chairman from Paris, Morgan Rupre. I'm very pleased to welcome you all online for the second part of the ESOU online, together with Alexandra Masson Lecomte from Paris, France, Hospital Saint Louis, Ashish Kamat from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, and uh, Thomas Paul from the NHS ba Barts Cancer Center. Um, so we have. One medical oncologist uh, and one uh, urologist uh, together with Alexandra. We are going to go through your clinical case, and I think you will uh, raise all along the way different questions, and uh, we'll try to interact with you and make it uh, as uh, lively as we can. So we are listening to you, Alexandra. Thank you. Okay, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So we will. Uh, I will present a, a clinical case about how to extend the benefit of immuno oncology to more muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. So here is the case. It's a 62 years old male. Uh, he has good performance status. He's active. He plays, he plays golf and he hides quite well some comorbidities because he suffers from hypertension. He has a mild chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease because of uh, heavy smoking in the past years. And uh, he has a, a little renal insufficiency with GFR 59 milliliter per minute. Um, he presented gross hematuria that led to the uh, realization of a, a CT scan that you can see on the right, uh, where a, a left uh, bladder wall uh, tumor uh, was discovered. This was confirmed by the cystoscopy uh, that showed the solid, five cent solid appearance, five centimeter vesicle tumor. And uh, we completed the, the, um, the radiology uh, workup with an MRI showing uh, a T2 lesion with no fat invasion and no pelvic nodes. Uh, there was no distant metastasis on the uh, CT scan, sorry, and we performed a complete TURBT. The pathologist um, described a high-grade muscle invasive urethral carcinoma with squamous differentiation and some lymphovascular invasion. So here's the first question. What you, would you offer to this uh, patient uh, as neoadjuvant treatment? Would you offer him cisplatin-based neoadjuvant therapy? So here are, the, uh, here are the, uh, the options. Yes, yes, but you would be worried about his renal function and comorbidities. Yes, but you would be worried about his variant histology or uh, no, you wouldn't because you think he's uh, ineligible to cisplatin. Before we answer your question, can we have one question to you? Uh, is there any description of the proportion of the squamous um, variant histological uh, pattern uh, regarding the uh, proportion of uh, pure urotenal yes. carcinoma. I thought about that during the case. Uh, it's not a majority. Let's say it's 30 percent. 30 percent. So, um, contingent upon the fact that we are happy with what you said, uh, Ashish, what what would you do? What would you choose? Yeah, you know, I, I lost the presentation for a quick second uh, in there. Let me let me just clarify. Um, his renal function is adequate versus platinum. It's 59 milliliter per minute. So it's right on the border. Uh, someone like this here, we would definitely offer cisplatinum-based new adjuvant chemotherapy. In the community, you may not um, in the United States, but in a center such as ours at, at uh, Academic Center. And I would not really be worried too much about uh, squamous um, in there. If you look at the SWOG study, in fact, the squamous patients responded in some um, better uh, to new adjuvant cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. So this patient, I, I clearly would offer cisplatinum-based chemotherapy too, uh, with the caveat that I, I didn't miss some of your presentation, but 59 would be a appropriate at our side. Tom? Yeah, I'm all in uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy. I would encourage him to stop playing golf because I think it's a very dull sport, but I'm all in with the new adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's quite straightforward answer. So, Alexandra? Can we move on? Okay, so when you're worried about the renal function, actually, this is the guide, the, the, the EAU guidelines, and to offer neoadjuvant cisplatin based neoadjuvant chemotherapy to patients who are cisplatin eligible. This patient is just uh, on the border, but uh, I guess that uh, in uh, experienced uh, centers, uh, we would go for, for chemotherapy uh, in this patient. However, uh, it is already said in the guidelines that you can offer neoadjuvant immunotherapy to patients uh, in a clinical trial uh, setting. And since this patient had some comorbidities, he was on the border regarding his renal function, I was wondering if we were, if, if you would project yourself in the near future, maybe in a few years, if we had more results of uh, the trials, do you think that 
uh, in the tumor world, we would discuss some alternative uh, preoperative treatments for this patient. So do you think that, no? Do you think that we might uh, discuss uh, to offer here uh, him in Alex, some... let me be super clear. Let me, let me be super clear. There's no role for neoadjuvant immune therapy. The data is promising. There are two publications in Nature Medicine in the last week or two. There's um, some good data on a Tezo, repeat path CR rates, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent. But it's all really experimental based on a handful of patients. And it's really not indicated right now. Now, that might change. And there's a number of exciting trials. But I'm really nervous about this approach. I would really, rec I really would strongly not recommend this approach as it currently stands. Yes, that, that's exactly what I said. I said, if you project yourself in the future, I'm not asking, would you do it oh. now? Of course, yeah. now. Well, I mean, I, so I think the answer to that question, I'm involved in a lot of these trials and they're bound to be negative for that reason. So, uh, and, uh, so I think that, I mean, the way I look at the neoadjuvant studies is the following. I'm joking about that, by the way. I hope they're positive. We've got chemotherapy plus immune therapy combinations. That's not worked out very well in metastatic disease. As we know, 361 and 130 with a telezo plus chemo and plembro plus chemo has not worked out well. So the chemo immune combinations, the jury's out. The monotherapy neoadjuvant trials look active with only two or three cycles. And I'm hopeful. And I've just seen some terrific data for Dervatremi and Ipinevo pdl one CTLA4. I personally feel those trials are going to be positive in the future in the neoadjuvant setting. So yes, in five years time, you might be right. Okay. You know, I, I would echo uh, exactly what Tom said. I mean, you know, because right now, if you look at the data, it's almost too good to be true. It remains to be seen what the results of the trials come out. The Durva Tremi, JJ Gao presented in, in Nature Medicine, uh, the publication. I mean, so they look very exciting and, and promising, but at the current time, if this patient was not a candidate for cisplatin-based chemotherapy, I would actually recommend upfront surgery for this patient and then treat based on what we find on pathology. I totally agree with that, Ashish. And, and, and what do you guys think about the possibility of delivering the, the, the regular pass, I would say neoadjuvant, to go for surgery, and when there are aggressive patterns and the pathological assessment to go for, uh, I would say, salvage, uh, EO adjuvant treatment, or do you think there is room for this? Uh, the whole perioperative uh, uh, setting would be uh, in a condition to deliver the drug before and after, or you believe more in the concept of combination from the beginning? I mean, I think the adjuvant story is confusing and complicated. I, I actually, I'm a, a broad supporter if you can't give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And, but I, and I tend to focus on the higher risk patients who I give adjuvant therapy to, but it's not something that I encourage. I think the level 1A evidence is for neoadjuvant treatment. I was intrigued that we have a negative atezolizumab adjuvant trial, and we have a press release for a positive nivolumab adjuvant trial for disease-free survival, not overall survival. So I can see the space changing. I think the one area where I would give adjuvant chemotherapy is in upper tract TCC. There was a PALT study, a neoadjuvant chemotherapy, sorry, an adjuvant chemotherapy study with quite good hazard ratios. The trial was stopped early because the DFS hazard ratio was good. So that's the, probably the one group where I would preferentially give adjuvant chemotherapy. Tom, if I might ask you a question, in, in, you know, extrapolating yes, from your Javelin study, um, what's your thought process in patients who have bulky disease, maybe even node positive disease in the pelvis, get new adjuvant chemotherapy, undergo cystectomy, and have a good response to the chemo, but clearly are still at high risk for having recurrence? Would you recommend, based on your data, putting them on a yeah. maintenance type of IO therapy after surgery? Ashish, that was my really big hope for the adjuvant atezolizumab trial. Because, you know, thinking about what you've just said, all you've really done differently in the neo, because the, the neo adjuvant, because the Javelin trial had many node positive patients in it, many patients with quite minimal metastatic disease. Under those circumstances, that subgroup really should have been positive. But we didn't see the neo adjuvant group and we didn't see the lymph node positive group having these big benefits. So the answer to your question is, it's probably the most confusing issue for me. 
currently. And then the last piece is the PDL1 status in this group. We'd expect the PDL1 positives to do slightly better, but that wasn't the case. There was a bit of drift because it was prognostic. So in that trial, I'm really confused at the moment by that, that data set. And I think we need to see more clarity in the future around that. But I can't currently support that approach as much as I'd like to. All right. So the aim of this uh, clinical case was to have you discuss what will be the options of this patient in the future. So this question was about what could be the alternative treatment in the future, non-monotherapy combination or combination with others. So here are all the ongoing trials that are going on now about neoadjuvant now treatment for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Thank you for discussing those extensively. Uh, so you have some trials about immune therapy as single agent, as combination, or as combination with chemotherapy, and I am moving on. Uh, so I just put this slide to show that we also already have the results of very small trials with small numbers, but that are promising with Abacus Pure and Nabucco. Uh, the safety profile reg regarding adverse events uh, is uh, very reassuring with low adverse events when uh, the drug is administered as one treatment. Um, it's a little bit more concerning with the results from the book that show 55% of uh, grade 3 and 4 adverse events when we administered the drug in combination. And we have to remember that then the patient is supposed to undergo uh, radical cystectomy, which is a morbid procedure. So uh, let's see in the future how, how it goes. Regarding variant histologies, as you said, uh, it's not a concern neither for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy nor for uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy, since the results from Pure Zero Round seems to uh, show that uh, the efficacy of the treatment is not uh, modified by um, squamous differentiation. So here is the third question. Do you foresee important markers that will be needed in the tumor bore in the future, in the upcoming years, not now? If we want to decide between chemotherapy or neoadjuvant immunotherapy or other molecular treatments, uh, no. Do you think that immune treatments or immune markers will be uh, the most important, such as pd one status, CD8 infiltration? Do you think that mutations will be considered, uh, FGFR3, uh, DNA damage, repeat gene alterations? Or do you think that uh, ureteral differentiation markers, uh, such as uh, luminal, basal, or neuroendocrine, will be the, the most important ones to consider? Ashish, can um, you Alex, can I, 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 I would select all of the above. Uh, you know, our, our group and others have been have been working with this for quite some time now, and there's not just one pathway or one marker that's going to help us identify which therapy for which patient. So, in, in fact, a composite assay looking at two, three, and four together, I think. Um, and right now, it's a research tool. I mean, there's a lot of publications, a lot of consensus documents, a lot of discussion about which marker is the best. Currently, I look at them more, for, for the most part, you know, it's, it's with selected you know, differences, um, as still research tools. But in the future, I think a composite of two, three, and four will be something that will help guide us. There is a cost issue coming along with the, the, the use of the marker and the molecular characterization. How do you see that it would be possible for uh, all of the patients to have a broad access to all these uh, new platforms and technology because we are all working in, uh, I would say, uh, reference centers, but uh, for uh, any patient uh, going, coming to the office of uh, urologist or medical oncologist, do you see that uh, these techniques will be uh, less costly uh, within the near future? In the U.S., at least, the cost has dropped dramatically. Um, I mean, now, clearly, you know, in, in ivory towers, academic centers, all patients get all assays done. But even in the community, a lot of folks are sending these out and getting the results back at a cost that is very palatable, either to the payers in the U.S. or the patients if they're asked to, you know, contribute out of pocket. Our system is obviously a lot different from, from the system in, in Europe. But even so... I suspect that we won't do this in everybody, but in patients that we suspect are either a higher risk of having progression of their disease, either on bank tissue or fresh tissue, this will actually become quite routine um, or even more routine than it currently is. My well, take on it is that the biomarker story as it currently stands, there are more questions than answers. The only one we have thoroughly investigated as primary endpoint is the PDL1 positive population. And every trial that's pursued that has been negative. Um, TMB holds promise, but is not as mature as that. CD8 infiltration seems more marked earlier in the disease process. But in the Nabucco trial, it didn't come through as being significant. It was significant in Abacus, and it was also significant in Pure One. 
I think TMB uh, is complicated. It's a surrogate marker. And again, the results have been inconsistent, as I said before. I'm not sure the molecular TCG analysis holds the key to these questions. And so I actually disagree with what Ashish has said about all of the above. I would say that we're in a position where we now have a lot of tools, but we don't really know how to use them well enough. And there's a huge area of research over the next five years in this area because it's going to be really important. Um, and let's not ignore bladder cancer. Let's not ignore biomarkers in bladder cancer. I actually think we're doing better work in bladder cancer in biomarkers than prostate and kidney cancer um, as it stands. And I think that's because we've had to because our drugs struggle to get over the line sometimes. But that's not a good thing. That's, a, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Let's imagine this patient was included in a trial and received neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Uh, he had no adverse event and radiological partial response. Uh, the cystectomy was scheduled three weeks after the end of neoadjuvant treatment, and I was wondering if you, can, you think that the patient will need special counseling regarding postoperative adverse events after neoadjuvant uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, the short answer is no. We've been doing cystectomies after IO therapy since 2007. Um, essentially, we wait for about a four-week washout simply because otherwise sometimes the bowel uh, lymphoid tissue is inflamed and it does make the neobladder and other things a little bit uh, more difficult. But short answer, no. Um, there's, there's no reason for any specific post-op uh, AE uh, consideration with neoadjuvant IO therapy. Yes, Tomas. So I agree with that. The surgical process is relatively straightforward. Two really important caveats. The first is that if the patient's coming into harm's way with a neoadjuvant approach and they've got grade three toxicity, it can take four to six weeks for that toxicity to settle. And so don't keep hammering the immune therapy because you're going to have to get that operation done. So as soon as the patients are getting into harm's way with the immune therapy, unlike in metastatic disease where you're happy to treat through toxicity, or you might be, I'm not particularly, but make sure you liaise with the surgeon, start steroids early, don't give a second or third cycle. And importantly, in the follow-up period, remember the half-life of these drugs are long. We're publishing some work in the near future around Abacus. We saw four patients develop toxicity during the adjuvant period, one, one of which developed pan hyperpituitaryism, so pituitary hormones went up the spout. That's complicated to manage. So you're going to need to see these patients postoperatively on a six-week basis to make sure they're not coming into harm's way. We didn't have to do that with chemotherapy. We do need to do it with immune therapy. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so the results from the study are, are quite reassuring regarding Clavian 4 and th 3 and 4 adverse events and 30 days mortality. However, there was a, a presentation uh, uh, at the virtual EAU this summer saying that nephrectomy after immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, can be uh, uh, very technically challenging. And I think we need to have more patients operated to uh, be absolutely sure that, uh, that there are no technical difficulties. But uh, Shisha uh, response is quite reassuring. So to finish, this patient had an uh, open radical cystectomy that went well, no major complications, but on the pathology report, there is a small remainder of pure T2 ureteral carcinoma, uh, no lymphovascular invasion, and zero R0. So you discussed at question two a little bit about adjuvant treatment. So the question would be, uh, would you offer any adjuvant treatment to those patients? None. Would you go for adjuvant chemotherapy if there is a remainder of T2 after uh, immunotherapy uh, as first line? Would you go for adjuvant immunotherapy or even maintenance immunotherapy or other? You discussed this uh, already a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's a discussion about adjuvant chemotherapy. There's a discussion about doing nothing. Those are the two discussions to have, I think. Yes, okay. so the recommendations would be not to offer any adjuvant treatment uh, uh, to this patient who has T2 disease. And you discussed a little bit uh, the Javelin trial, and maybe this will be a question in the future, future to have some maintenance treatment to those patients that were treated with new adjuvant uh, uh, immune checkpoints. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I think uh, it's uh, really interesting for us, I would say, as, as urologists to see how rapidly all these drugs are coming along and moving from the metastatic setting to the earlier stages of the natural history of the disease, which was not the case, for instance, for renal cell carcinoma. And uh, we are uh, fascinating with uh, all these trials, but not only the trials, the money which is invested in uh, translational research on bladder cancer now 
uh, it's a new era and I think it's absolutely important to understand that all this research would benefit uh, to all the community and uh, the, 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 the better understanding of the behavior and the, and the pathway uh, along bladder cancer. So thank you all for this um, second part of the ESOU ES online.